great. And here I get to follow an outstanding choir anthem and then a trio. I mean, you can't wait to hear me. <laughs> Scripture today comes from Titus, book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Even one of their own prophets, he said, priests are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure of all things, to, to, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. May God bless the writing of Paul to his good friend Titus here today. The Christian faith has not been without controversial leaders. From antiquity on, there have been controversial leaders, and we are looking at one uh, for nine weeks. And one, he is the Apostle Paul. But we know there are others. Martin Luther, uh, the monk, scholar, leader of the Protestant Reformation, had some very complex views. Some even say that Martin Luther was a racist. And early in his career, he had a high opinion of the Jews. He said they should be of honor, they should be protected. He viewed them as honorable members of the family of Abraham and Jesus. But later on in his life, he had a dramatic change in his view on Jews. After seeing German Jews fail to accept Jesus Christ, Luther was quoted as saying, I do not wish to have anything more to do with any Jew. And he wrote a book on the Jews and their lives. I guess the title of the book kind of is all I need to say really about. But he asked a practical question, what shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? So Luther goes from this cranky, ranting scholar, leader of the Reformation, maybe into what we would call today a racist. He's seen to have hate speech. In fact, he's quoted as saying, Christians cannot convert Jews, so, here's his quote, first, set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn. Secondly, he says, I advise that their houses be razed and destroyed. He wasn't done. He advocated their writings be confiscated, that the rabbis be forbidden to teach on pain of life and limb, and he used Deuteronomy 13 to support what he was saying. He goes on to say, I would recommend that putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a spade, or a spindle into the hands of the young and strong Jew and Jewesses, and letting them earn their own bread by the sweat of their brow. Adolf Hitler shared with Luther the deep desire to be rid of the unbearable devilish burden of the Jews. That's not Hitler's quote. That's Martin Luther's Now, get, um, Martin Luther did not quote Paul, but he felt that the Apostle Paul would have supported his views. Luther reasoned they are consigned to wrath. The more one tries to help them, the more stubborn they become. Leave them to their own desires. After the Holocaust, there were many tensions in the United States. It can't be blamed on a personality quirk of a religious theologian. And so we looked at Paul and to see if he was an anti-Semite. And if he was, wouldn't that create a problem for our faith, for Christianity? Maybe it's a terminal problem, if that were true. You know, handling a cranky and unpleasant Paul, that's one thing, but it doesn't affect our faith that much. But if he were to have moments of racism, they 
wouldn't that compromise the integrity of the gospel just a bit? So that's what we're going to look at today. Did Paul hate on a race of people, condemn them to torture and death, based, based on their ethnicity? Did he do that? Because if he did, that would be a major flaw in Paul's message. So let's look at the vocabulary. Conversations about race uh, are complicated for a lot of reasons. And we've experienced some of them. We have lived in a lifetime of segregation and of integration. And we know we've all had times when we've had run-ins or were a party to one individual being harmed because of something, whether it's color, education, social standing. But today we break that down. We're sophisticated in our racism talk. So we, we look at it as individual racism, systemic racism, cultural racism, and they can even be divided into even further categories in those. But here when we talk about racism, today when I'm talking about racism, hear it this way. The belief that some races or ethnicities are superior to others. That's what we're talking about. That some races or ethnicities are superior to A comment is racist whether it's a compliment or it's derogatory. So because you're complimenting somebody because of their race or ethnicity doesn't mean it's not a racist statement. So we'll be looking at the content, the content, the content of things that were happening in Paul's day comparing them with today, the 20th to 21st century, and see if Paul would be a racist in 21st century standards. And I will tell you, there are people that write about Paul being racist. I'm not telling you I do that. And you'll see, maybe by the time you get to the end, if you're awake and you listen, you'll tell me. <laughs> Because it's important to know some of these people that we quote daily or that we go to for answers, how they how they work, how they felt. <coughs> what do the words mean that we read? Because I would submit to you today, we read the Bible many times incorrectly. So let's see if the strong statements that come from Paul about non-Jewish ethnic groups would be racist. I think if we look at them just on the whole, we would say our term today is politically incorrect. But you have to look deeper to find out exactly what Paul's meaning was. So in his letter to Titus, who is a young pastor in Crete, he's somebody that Paul has raised up, and he's younger than Paul. And Paul calls Titus's congregation intractable. A lot of work we do a lot of. It means unmanageable, uncontrollable, difficult, awkward, troublesome, demanding, and burdensome. Ever had a district superintendent say that's not one of the best districts you were in? <laughs> Pastor Chuck, your church is intractable. <laughs> well, we heard in the scripture what he also called Christians. They're always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Paul describes a group of people living in a place this way. And he affirms it because we read, he says, he only, he only, only says that, then he says, this statement is true. In his letter to the Galatians, and we even said this last week, he calls the Galatians foolish. Now, we look at that and go, well, that's not, that's not so bad. But in Paul's day, that would have been a slur to call a group of people foolish. Here's what it would be like. Calling southerners rednecks, hillbillies, white trash. Is that a slur? I'll bet that the people that grew up in the south, they feel like it. But Luke, who writes Luke and Acts, who writes a lot about Paul, writes about the same, these same people in Acts 14. And what does he call them? Lyconians, people from Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pantheon. 
Paul uses other words. Luke uses what they actually were called. Tennesseans, Georgians, Alabamans, Mississippians. And Paul is just as colorful as Gentiles. He seems, he seems though to be the harshest against his own people, the Jews. Paul is a Jew. And he's harsh against them. He calls Jews, here at Christ killers, people who have their hearts set against God, not only have they killed the Lord Jesus, but also prophets who were proclaiming God's word. He says, they drove us out. In Thessalonians, they displease God and are hostile to everyone. This is what Paul is saying about the Jews. Don't, don't, don't get lost. He's quoted at Isaiah 65. Israel is a disobedient and obstinate people. This is not theoretical for Paul. He says, five times I've received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Paul has feelings about his own people. Because he got those lashes for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he calls the Jews okay, dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh, enemies of the cross of Christ, whose destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and glory is in their shame. Why, Paul? Because their mind is set on earthly things. He compares the Cretans, lazy. Galatians, simple-minded and foolish. Wow, that seems pretty mild compared to what he says about the Jews. It's almost complimentary. <laughs> the Jews to Paul, and what he says about them is powerful and personal. So as we read Paul's letters, we need to understand to Paul, who were the Jews? Who were the Jews? Because it's, it's complex, and we have to understand it, and we don't understand it, we're going to read it incorrectly, and I would say for years, that's how it's been interpreted, and that's how we read it. You can decide that on your own. But Paul is also the one that says there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. But in, and he insists that the Israelites have a special role, role in God's plan of salvation. How do we balance all that? So who were the Jews? Well, Paul looks like he's very inconsistent about his opinion on the Jews. So we have to look at his writings and recognize who is he talking about. Because maybe the way he's talking about it are specific roles to him and ethnicities to him that we read differently. So we use the word Jew to refer to someone in the that appears to Judaism, has a personal Jewish history, no matter where they are from. For we Westerners, for we Western Americans, Jew is an umbrella that includes an entire race and religion of people. When we say Jew, we include everybody. <coughs> Whether they're called Israelites, or Hebrew, or Jew, they're all the same to us. That's why when, when Paul charges the Jews with the death, the death of Jesus, we hear that he is claiming that the entire race and religion of the Jews put Jesus to death. And that would be anti-Semitic. Because that is not what Paul meant. Understand, and let's be clear here. When Paul says that, it is about a specific group of people, but it's not the entire race and religion of the Jews. When Paul chastises the Jews, he singles out specific parties within what we call first century Judaism. I don't know if you want to be called Christian if the term means fundamental Christian, conservative Christian, liberal Christian, non-practicing Christian, which Christian are you? Because if you say, well, I'm a Christian, then somebody might say, oh, they're fundamental, they handle snakes. They believe a certain way, they don't eat certain things, they don't drink certain things. They're Christians. 
Oh, they're Christians. That means they can go to church when they want to. They practice how they want to. Most of them are hypocrites. Christians. So we have to be really clear when we talk about how Paul is identifying Jews here. He calls them, the ones he's talking about that are all these terrible things, are Judaizers. And it's the only time he identifies them by that is in Galatians. He identifies them by name. And Judaize here is a verb. It's the way this group of people acts. They Judaize. They're Judaizers. And here's Paul's meaning. It's a it's shorthand for a Jewish background Christian who believe that pagan converts to Christianity have to keep the law of Moses, specifically circumcision. If you're not circumcised, you're not in. That's a Judaizer. Did Paul believe that? No. Paul refers to this group as dogs, evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh that believe that the only way you can be converted is to be circumcised, even as a Christian. So Philippians 3, 2, Paul is not calling all Jews, he thinks, just a small group of ethnic Israelites who are followers of Jesus, but the distort the gospel teaching. And one thing we can say about Paul, if at any moment anybody distorted the gospel, he was on them. Like a dog on a bone. He would chew them up. Nobody distorted the gospel around Paul. And these Judaizers were doing that. And Paul let them have it. So when we read Paul about the Jews, some of it's Paul's own fault. The way he uses the translation, or the way we translate Paul. Because he uses the word Jew and Jews a lot, but he's talking about Judaizers. We use Jew and Jude, uh, Judean. We didn't use them interchangeably. We use Israelite interchangeably. We say Israelite, Jew, Hebrew, Judean, Judaizer. We, we use it all the same. But they're distinctly different. Just as we have our own roots within our faith today. In Jesus and Paul's day, the term Judean was to describe a specific subset of people. And we know there's a difference because there's insiders and outsiders. That's why we don't see... Jesus being called a Jew, except by outsiders. What did insiders call Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Galilee. Jesus, the carpenter's son. You don't ever hear an insider call Jesus a Jew. Only outsiders call him that. The woman at the well thought Jesus was a Judean. Why? She was an outsider. The Magi came, and who were they looking for? The king of the Jews. They were outsiders. When Jesus is on the cross, what's the sign over his head? King of the Jews. What? They were outsiders that were putting him to death. What did the insiders consider Jesus? The king of Israel. Not the king. So when we have that reading, we need to understand the reason he wasn't called <coughs> Judean is because he wasn't one. Herod, Judas, they were Judean. Paul described himself as an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. But outsiders tend to lump Israelites in with Judeans and Jews. For example, if we were in England, when we were in Israel, we were in the garden tomb. We were going to take the tour. A man from England said, he heard our talk, our accent. He said, oh, you are Yankees. I said, yes. Now, if Nancy Sudbury goes to Michigan, and they say, oh, are you a Yankee? She's going to say, oh, no, I'm from the South. <laughs> because we have regional pride. And so that's the same thing that happens here in the first century. We tend to lump all Israelites, Judean, Jews, Hebrews, all together. Well, we don't lump ourselves here together, but there are times when we go away from here that we are lumped together. In Israel, we were all Yankees. We were from 25 different states. So how does Paul use the term Jew? When Paul says the Jews killed Jesus, he 
says that because that group stopped him from spreading the gospel. And he's talking about the Judeans. Because Paul, the word Judean, had an ethnic, geographic, and religious connotation. Judean meant from Judea, ethnic and geographic. Paul was a Judean in the broad sense because he was raised in Jerusalem, but it also meant your religious center was in Yahweh in Jerusalem. The Samaritans thought that Yahweh was at Mount Gerizim, the true temple of Yahweh, according to the Samaritans. Paul then is condemning the Jews of Judea for killing Christ, not all Jews. And those that opposed or roadblocked the gospel were not Jews, but Judeans in Israel. So it can be said that Paul is not speaking of all the Israelites that live in Judea. He's probably not including the all <coughs> in Bethpage or the persimmon grower in Hyrcania, but he was including those that ardently defended the temple and their homeland against Rome and anyone that was And there's a word here, Iodios. Iodios is a Greek word that is translated Judean. And Paul uses it too much. And so when all these translators from years down the line, it gets translated as Jew. And so we read Jew incorrectly because we include people that were doing things to Christ that were not. not. So as an insider, though, as an insider, you would know exactly what Paul was talking about. But to the outsiders, like the Gentiles, they didn't know. So they lump all the Jews into it. Now, we know there's modern standards of racism, and there's plenty of racism in antiquity, and plenty of racism in the Bible. And here's a, <coughs> an example of racism from the Greek poet Petronius, who did live in the first century. Here's his word. The Jew may worship his pig god and clamor in the ears of high heaven, but unless he also cuts back with the knife the religion of his groin, and unless he unloosens by art the knot of his knotted head, he shall go forth from the holy city, cast forth from the people, and transgress the Sabbath by breaking the law of fasting. Very anti-Semitic talk by a Greek poet in the first century about Jews and outside. We associate modern racism with skin color. But in the first century, they rarely commented on such things. They might see an African as being darker, but they wouldn't talk to talk about him as his color. They would admire his fierce uh, fighting or, or warriorism. That's what he would look like. Racism was based on religion, ethnicity, and geography. He said a Judean was from Judean, but almost certainly ethnicity had particular religious persuasions. Worshiping Yahweh in the temple in Jerusalem was one of those. Does Paul employ slurs? Yes. Does Paul deal in stereotypes? Yes. And we know living in America today, changing one's vocabulary doesn't change one's heart, but at least it's a step in the right direction. So we know that even if we don't necessarily feel it on the inside, at least we should not have racist talk. When we go to the Dominican Republic, we don't see color as much as we see poverty, the lack of clothing, the lack of education, or lack of opportunity. We don't really see the color. That never comes up. But what does come up? The lack of food, the lack of education. And Paul uses slurs and stereotypes because He's a rhetor. He's a salesman. He's someone that's selling the gospel. And so he uses that to do his stuff. He's skilled at this. That's why he calls them foolish Galatians. That's a slur in the first century. But he uses that because he wants to get them riled up. He wants to get them on his side and he wants to let them know that he wants to validate the stereotype that is being talked about by outsiders about his Galatians. He doesn't use the correct translation, which would be Pamphylians or Lycoonians. He calls them books. The same is true as when he calls the Cretans liars. They were called liars because they didn't accept Zeus as immortal. So 
Paul instructs Titus to explain the truth to them, the truth about the gospel. He spoke this loud to Titus in front of Titus's congregation. Something like, it's time for these Cretan Christians to stop acting like Cretan pagans. Titus 3, 1 through 3 says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Paul is inclusive here. He said, I've been there. I've been like, I've been exactly where you are. I've acted disobediently. I've been foolish. I've been hated and not hated. I know where you are. So let's try to finish this up. Let's be, try to be, let me, hopefully I'll be clear. This may not be one of the best ways to imitate Paul. You may want, not want to spread the gospel exactly in this way by insulting people and letting them know what other people are saying about it. It may not be the best. In fact, any radically changed language from what you normally speak in public may, may not be the right thing to do. It may be just find the way you spread the gospel. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you spread it. Because I think if Paul were here in the 21st century, if Paul were among us, if Paul were your preacher today, I don't think he would use hurtful racial stereotypes. I think he would choose his words carefully. I think he would adapt to culture. I don't think he wants us to feel too uncomfortable in who we are, where we were raised, and how we were brought to faith. So we can't listen to those in the 20th century that compare Paul to radicals. The radicals from the 1st century compare them to the radicals of the 20th century. I think that's unfair because Paul didn't live in the 20th century. But I think if he did, he would have adjusted. And we also know that Christians for years have been some of the worst in spreading the heinous racism that is going on in this country. Christians have done that. We've seen Christians battle racism on both sides of it for years. And I would implore you to lead in anti-racism if you are a believer in the gospel. So those off-color jokes that kind of are needle and funny about a particular group of people really aren't funny. Yes, I've participated. And I've heard many more. And there's nothing, nothing proud in that for me. But I don't. And when I get to my email, I delete them. And I don't forward them for sure. And even though it does look funny, we are in a powerful position as white Americans. And I know there's a lot of talk out there today where the, the white people are not are being abused and threatened and oppressed. Baloney. We need to lead as Christians the gospel message which has no racist talk, joke, innuendo, slur, stereotype in it. Paul was a leader in cross-cultural ministries. We should take that from him. He ministered to people he was told not to by his good friends, the Gentiles. The disciples were not in favor of going to the Gentiles of Poland because Christ gave him a specific task that he took hold of and he went to a different group of people, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew ministering to the Gentiles. And not only ministering to them and spreading the gospel, but telling them there's no difference in Jew or Gentile, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And even though we're not the same, we are equal. And Paul had to combat this in his churches. 
He said there should be no divisions, but there were divisions in his churches. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Cephas. He heard others even say, I follow Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians. And so I put up there. Apollos' church was Hellenized. It means it was speaking the Greek, in the Greek language to Jews, which came out of Alexandria. And they interpreted scripture allegorically, which means they sort of made up their own allegories about some of these stories, but really probably was some really interesting preaching. They thought it was correct. It probably was interesting. Cephas church, composed of Palestinian Jews, they didn't even use Petros, Peter's name. They called him Cephas. They, that was an Aramaic. Paul's church to the Gentiles, probably where they got at home the most. It's easy to see how language tends to sift people. And even today, we have people that say, I go to Pastor Jones's church or Pastor Cindy's church. No. Why do we do that? Why do we, one, put pressure on this position? None of us are capable of leading in the way that Christ is. That's whose church you go to. I worship Christ. Who's your pastor? Oh, uh, it's this person. But I go and worship Christ here. But some of us tie our wagons to the pastor. Where's Aaron? Isn't that right? That's not right, is it? Well, maybe it was for Aaron. It wasn't for me. No. no. And I know it wasn't. I know him. We don't tie, Fred would be saying the same thing if he were here. You don't tie it to Pastor Chuck. But boy, people will get mad at me and they would bail. Or hope they go to a Christ church, at least not stay at home. Mm -hmm. Believe me, if you're looking for me for all the answers, you're not going to get them all. But the cross has them all. The gospel has them all. So consult that. I'll, I'll try to help you. Paul was radical that in his day, Jews and Gentiles, in his view, could become united. Now, we have a Seventh-day church here that meets on Saturdays. They are a Trinitarian church. They speak Spanish. And we don't do anything with them. We've tried to do some things, but they worship on Saturday, we worship on Sunday, so they're having fun on today, we had fun on yesterday, and we had trouble getting together. But I would tell you, come by here on Saturday. Meet them. They're great people. They'll tell you, happy Sabbath. That's what they tell George and I do. Happy Sabbath. Great people. There's two other churches beside us. Do we know them? Do we know their pastors? Do we know what's going on with them? We, we, could, get, we could start doing things with them. I can tell you, all of us are struggling. All of us need more people. All of us need more programs. They're right beside us. Paul felt that he was doing his cross-cultural cross ministry because he had a special responsibility to do it. Why are we here? For if Paul's concerned the gospel was a Jews and Gentiles equal, not the same, they were all brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes, sometimes your brothers and sisters are the very ones who love you the most and are the ones that should have permission to use the strongest language to keep you on the straight and <laughs> And many times, for your pastor included, it is for his own good. So the answer to the question, was Paul a racist? Absolutely. Are we racist? Answer that question, please. <laughs> if you're passing on a joke about a racist, if you're passing on a joke about a color, about an education, or the lack of, the social standing of a group, the color of somebody's hair, know that if your dog or your wife is that color hair, it may just not be. If you're joking about a section of the country, it just may not be as funny if you do. Oh, no, uh, Pastor, you mean we can't have any fun? No. 
There's a lot of fun to be had without the expense of someone else. And as believers in Jesus Christ, I'll bet you that's the kind of joke you The ones that don't hurt anybody's people. But they're laughing like crazy. Oh, I need a loving father.